one, the hits. Welcome to Learning English on the Voice of America. I'm Katie Weaver. Our program is designed for people learning English. We speak slowly using simple grammar and a limited vocabulary. Today on the show, we have a report from Jill Robbins. Alice Bryant brings us Ask a Teacher, and we close the show with our program, American Stories. But first, evacuation flights from Afghanistan continued Friday under increased security. A day earlier, a suicide bombing at Kabul's airport killed more than 100 people, including 13 American soldiers. They were the first U.S. service members killed in Afghanistan since February 2020. That was the month the U.S., under former President Donald Trump, struck an agreement with the Taliban to end the 20-year war. The agreement called for the militant group to halt attacks on Americans in exchange for a U.S. troop withdrawal by May 2021. And U.S. President Joe Biden announced in April that he would have all forces out by September. In an emotional speech Thursday night, Biden blamed the Islamic State Group, or ISIS, for the attacks. He said, We will hunt you down and make you pay. We will respond with force and precision at our time, at the place of our choosing, Biden said. These ISIS terrorists will not win. We will rescue the Americans. We will get our Afghan allies out. The ISIS group in Afghanistan is also known as ISIS Khorasan. The group is made up of extremists who left the Taliban. They were unhappy that the Taliban, now in control of Afghanistan, had sought peace talks with the U.S. The Khorasan group has joined in the Islamic State's call for a worldwide jihad, or holy war, against non-Muslims. General Frank McKenzie is head of U.S. Central Command. He said U.S. commanders are watching for more attacks by Islamic State, including possible rocket fire or car bombs targeting the airport. The Taliban's return to power has terrified many Afghans. The group is asking Afghans to stay to rebuild the country but many fear the group will establish the repressive rule it held when last in control, 20 years ago. Unknown numbers of Afghans, especially ones who had worked with the U.S. and other Western countries, are now in hiding. Afghans have reported that the Taliban is barring girls from attending school. The group is also carrying out home searches, seeking Afghans who worked with Western countries. Some people hoping to flee arrived Friday at the Kabul airport. They came through an area set up by Taliban fighters about 500 meters away from the airport's gate. Amadullah Harawi told the Associated Press, Believe me, I think that an explosion will happen any second or minute. God is my witness. But we have lots of challenges in our lives. That is why we take the risk to come here, and we overcome fear. The U.S. says more than 100,000 people have been safely evacuated from Afghanistan, but thousands more are still struggling to leave. On Friday morning, U.S. officials said that 8,500 people had flown out of the country on U.S. military airplanes since Thursday morning. 
another 4,000 people left on other Western flights. Many American allies have already ended their evacuation efforts. They want to give the U.S. time to complete its operation before getting 5,000 of its troops out by Tuesday. Afghans are expected to seek escape from the country over land also. The United Nations Refugee Agency said a half million people or more could flee in the coming months. The Taliban has said that it will permit Afghans to leave on passenger flights after the U.S. withdrawal. But the group is still trying to find a way to operate the airport. And no airlines have said they would return to an airport controlled by the militants. The airport bombings also raise questions about the Taliban's ability to bring security to Afghanistan. The Islamic State has carried out a series of violent attacks in Afghanistan, mainly targeting its Shiite Muslim minority. Ahmad Sarmast left his home in Melbourne, Australia, to help bring back music in his home country, Afghanistan. He started a school there that was different than most. It admitted children without parents and young people who had no homes. His school aimed to bring a little joy back to Kabul after the Taliban had banned music. Last week, Sarmast watched from his home in Australia as the Taliban marched into the Afghan capital. Their quick rise to power shocked him and the world. Now, Sarmast is wondering what will happen next. His two mobile phones have not stopped ringing since the takeover. Many of the calls are from worried students asking him what happens next. Will the school be closed? Will the Taliban ban music again? Are their prized musical instruments safe? I'm heartbroken, Sarmast told the Associated Press. It was so unexpected and so unpredictable that it was like an explosion and everyone was caught by surprise, he said of the Taliban takeover. Sarmast left Kabul on July 12th for his summer holiday. He could not have imagined that just a few weeks later, everything he had worked for in the past 20 years would be in danger. He worries about his 350 students and the 90 teachers at the school. Many of them have already gone into hiding. Reports of Taliban fighters searching for enemies door-to-door have increased their fears. We are all very, very fearful about the future of music. We are very fearful about our girls, about our faculty, Sarmast said. He asked reporters not to publish more information in order to protect the students and school. In a sign of what the future holds, radio and TV stations stopped broadcasting music except for Islamic songs. It was not clear if the change was a result of Taliban orders or an effort by the stations to avoid problems with the Taliban. Sarmast is 58 years old. He is the son of a famous Afghan composer. He sought asylum in Australia in the 1990s during a time of civil war in Afghanistan. After earning a doctoral degree in musicology, he returned to Afghanistan. In 2010, he founded the Afghanistan National Institute of Music. Foreign governments and private sponsors soon gave money to support the school. The World Bank gave the school two million U.S. dollars. Truckloads of musical equipment, 
violins, pianos, guitars, and oboes were sent from the German government and the German Society of Music Merchants. Students learned to play traditional Afghan string instruments like the rubab, sitar, and sarod. Elham Fanus, 24, was the first student to graduate from the Music Institute in 2014. After spending seven years at the school, he said, It was such an amazing school. Everything was perfect. It changed my life, and I really owe it to them. A visitor once called it Afghanistan's happy place. I cannot believe this is happening, Fanus added, speaking from New York. He recently received his master's degree in piano from the Manhattan School of Music. He was also the first student from Afghanistan to be admitted to a U.S. university music program. The Institute's musicians traveled all over the world to represent the peaceful side of their country. Fanus himself performed at events in Poland, Italy, and Germany. In 2013, the Institute's Youth Orchestra began its first U.S. tour. Members of the orchestra included a girl who not long ago had sold chewing gum on the streets of Kabul to earn a living. In 2015, the school formed an all-female orchestra called Zora. The group was named after a goddess of music in Persian culture. In 2014, Zarmast was attending a concert at a French-run high school in Kabul when a bomb exploded. He lost some of his hearing in one ear and has had numerous operations to remove pieces of metal from his head. The Taliban took responsibility for the suicide attack and accused him in a statement of corrupting Afghanistan's youth. That only increased Sarmat's wish to continue his work. He kept traveling between the school in Kabul and Australia, where his family lives. Sarmast said his students all had big dreams to play around the world. All my students had been dreaming of a peaceful Afghanistan, but that peaceful Afghanistan is fading away. Still, Sarmast is hopeful. He believes young Afghans will resist, and he wants the international artistic community to fight for the Afghans' right to music. I'm still hopeful that my kids will be allowed to go back to the school and continue to enjoy learning and playing music, he said. I'm Jill Robbins. This week on Ask a Teacher, we answer a question from Shohei from Japan. He says, I would like to know the difference between Americas and American. For example, are there any gaps in meaning between Americas people and American people? Hi, Shohei. The two phrases have the same general meaning. Both describe people who are from America or are living in America. But there are a few minor differences. One difference between the phrases is their grammar. The word Americas is a proper noun in possessive form. A proper noun is a particular name for a person, place, or thing. The apostrophe S after America shows possession. So, America's people means the people of or belonging to America. However, the word American is a proper adjective. In other words, it is an adjective formed from a proper noun. In the expression American people, the word American is an adjective that describes the noun people. American people 
is the more common way to describe people who are born in America or become American citizens. On the other hand, the phrase America's people is more literary. It is most often found in publications and documentary films and on things like historical websites. There is also one small difference in meaning. America's people can mean everyone who lives in America, including some who may not officially be U.S. citizens. It can also refer to the nation's immigrant history. So when a publication or film uses the phrase, they may talk about the many immigrant groups that make up the nation. And that's Ask a Teacher for this week. I'm Alice Bryant. And now it's time for an American story. Today we hear the second part of The Diamond Lens by Fitzjames O'Brien. When I was a child, someone gave me a microscope. I spent hours looking through that microscope, exploring nature's tiny secrets. As I grew up, I became more interested in my microscope than in people. When I was 20 years old, my parents sent me to New York City to study medicine. I never went to any of my classes. Instead, I spent all my time and a lot of my money trying to build the perfect microscope. I wanted to make a powerful lens that would let me see even the smallest parts of life. But all my experiments failed. Then, one day, I met a young man who lived in the apartment above mine. Jules Simon told me about a woman who could speak to the dead. When I visited Madame Volpe's, she let me speak to the spirit of the man who invented the microscope. The spirit of Anton Leeuwenhoek told me how to make a perfect lens from a diamond of 140 carats. But where could I find a diamond that big? When I returned home, I went to Simon's apartment. He was surprised to see me and tried to hide a small object in his pocket. I wanted to discover what it was, so I brought two bottles of wine to his apartment. We began to drink. By the time we had finished the first bottle, Simon was very drunk. Simon, I know you have a secret. Why don't you tell me about it? Something in my voice must have made him feel safe. He made me promise to keep his secret. Then he took a small box from his pocket. When he opened it, I saw a large diamond shaped like a rose, a pure white light seemed to come from deep inside the diamond. Simon told me he had stolen the diamond from a man in South America. He said it weighed exactly 140 carats. Excitement shook my body. I could not believe my luck. On the same evening that the spirit of Leeuwenhoek tells me the secret of the perfect lens, I find the diamond I need to create it. I decided 
to steal Simon's treasure. I sat across the table from him as he drank another glass of wine. I knew I could not simply steal the diamond. Simon would call the police. There was only one way to get the diamond. I had to kill Simon. Everything I needed to murder Simon was right there in his apartment. A bottle full of sleeping powder was on a table near his bed. A long, thin knife lay on the table. Simon was so busy looking at his diamond that I was able to put the drug in his glass quite easily. He fell asleep in 15 minutes. I put his diamond in my pocket and carried Simon to the bed. I wanted to make the police think Simon had killed himself. I picked up Simon's long, thin knife and stared down at him. I tried to imagine exactly how the knife would enter Simon's heart if he were holding the knife himself. I pushed the knife deep into his heart. I heard a sound come from his throat, like the bursting of a large bubble. His body moved, and his right hand grabbed the handle of the knife. He must have died immediately. I washed our glasses and took the two wine bottles away with me. I left the lights on, closed the door, and went back to my apartment. Simon's death was not discovered until three o'clock the next day. One of the neighbors knocked at his door, and when there was no answer, she called the police. They discovered Simon's body on the bed. The police questioned everyone, but they did not learn the truth. The police finally decided Jules Simon had killed himself, and soon everyone forgot about him. I had committed the perfect crime. For three months after Simon's death, I worked day and night on my diamond lens. At last, the lens was done. My hand shook as I put a drop of water on a piece of glass. Carefully, I added some oil to the water to prevent it from drying. I turned on a strong light under the glass and looked through the diamond lens. For a moment, I saw nothing in that drop of water, and then I saw a pure white light. Carefully, I moved the lens of my microscope closer to the drop of water. Slowly, the white light began to change. It began to form shapes. I could see clouds and wonderful trees and flowers. These plants were the most unusual colors, bright reds, greens, purples, as well as silver and gold. The branches of these trees moved slowly in a soft wind. Everywhere I looked, I could see fruits and flowers of a thousand different colors. How strange, I thought, that this beautiful place has no animal life in it. Then I saw something moving slowly among the brightly colored trees and bushes. The branches of a purple and silver bush were gently pushed aside, and there, before my eye, stood the most beautiful woman I had ever seen. She was perfect, pink skin, large blue eyes, and long golden hair that fell over her shoulders to her knees. She stepped away from the rainbow-colored trees. Like a flower, floating on water, she drifted through the air. 
Watching her move was like listening to the sound of tiny bells ringing in the wind. She went to the rainbow-colored trees and looked up at one of them. The tree moved one of its branches that was full of fruit. It lowered the branch to her, and she took one of the fruits. She turned it in her tiny hands and began to eat. How I wished I had the power to enter that bright light and float with her through those beautiful forests. Suddenly, I realized I had fallen in love with this tiny creature. I loved someone who would never love me back, someone who was a prisoner in a drop of water. I ran out of the room, threw myself on my bed, and cried till I fell asleep. Day after day, I returned to my microscope to watch her. I never left my apartment. I rarely even ate or slept. One day, as usual, I went to my microscope, ready to watch my love. She was there, but a terrible change had taken place. Her face had become thin, and she could hardly walk. The wonderful light in her golden hair and blue eyes was gone. At that moment... I would have given my soul to become as small as she and enter her world to help her. What was causing her to be so sick? She seemed in great pain. I watched her for hours, helpless and alone with my breaking heart. She grew weaker and weaker. The forest also was changing. The trees were losing their wonderful colors. Suddenly, I realized I had not looked at the drop of water for several days. I had looked into it with the microscope, but not at it. As soon as I looked at the glass under the microscope, I understood the horrible truth. I had forgotten to add more oil to the drop of water to stop it from drying. The drop of water had disappeared. I rushed again to look through the lens. The rainbow forests were all gone. My love lay in a spot of weak light. Her pink body was dried and wrinkled. Her eyes were black as dust. Slowly, she disappeared forever. I fainted and woke many hours later on pieces of my microscope. I had fallen on it when I fainted. My mind was as broken as the diamond lens. I crawled to my bed and withdrew from the world. When I finally got better, months later, all my money was gone. People now say I am crazy. They call me Linley, the mad scientist. No one believes I spoke to the spirit of Leeuwenhoek. They laugh when I tell them how I killed Jules Simon and stole his diamond to make the perfect lens. They think... I never saw that beautiful world in a drop of water. But I know the truth of the diamond lens. And now, so do you. <laughs> 